Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Rich Stern from Carnegie Mellon University here. Uh, Rich is a professor uh, in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and has been so since 1977. Is that right? January 10th. Uh, January 10th, 1977. Yes. And he has a, a joint appointment in uh, Computer Science and the Language Technologies Institute and the Biomedical Engineering Department and a very much a Renaissance man, a lecturer in the Music Department. Yes. Um, and is most well known for his work in robust speech recognition and in uh, uh, auditory uh, uh, perception. And uh, I think he's going to give us today an interesting talk on the latest work on matching those two areas uh, in applying uh, physiological uh, motivated models to speech recognition. So here's Rich. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And, and thank you, all of you. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely touched that all of you came here with this terrific talk right next door on uh, Avatar. I, I, I know it's good because I saw it yesterday. Uh, the only thing that I can say is my understanding is that all of these talks are recorded. Uh, and uh, you know, your reward for staying here now is that uh, you can see this firsthand and, and uh, then, then watch the Avatar talk on the video. Uh, <laughs> uh, as, as usual, I don't do any work anymore. Uh, everything that I'm talking about today is work that uh, various students of mine have done. Uh, I'll be, uh, in addition to everybody who's listed, many of whom you already know, uh, Yusheng Bosco Chu and uh, Chen Wu Kim uh, contributed most of the work that I'll be talking about today, and I'll try to identify their contributions as we encounter them. Um, as, uh, well, as you just heard, but, but most people have forgotten by now because it's such ancient history, uh, I was originally trained in auditory perception. Uh, my, my thesis was in binaural hearing, and um, let's see, over the last 20 some odd years, it's hard to keep track. I've been spending most of my time trying to uh, improve the accuracy of speech recognition systems in difficult acoustical environments. And uh, today I'd like to, as you heard, talk about some of the ways in which my group, and for that matter, those uh, pretty much across the land and other lands, have been attempting to apply knowledge of auditory perception to improve speech recognition accuracy. And uh, I'll, in the beginning, I'll talk about some general stuff that is transcendent for everywhere and then uh, you know, as time goes by, of necessity, I'll have to be more specific about things that we've done. Um, approaches can be more or less faithful to physiology and psychophysics. T today I'm wearing my engineering hat rather than my science hat, so the only thing that matters is lowering the error rate. Uh, but uh, hopefully paying attention to how the auditory system works may might be able to help us to do that. So uh, the big questions that we have are how can knowledge of auditory physiology and perception improve speech recognition accuracy? And uh, can speech recognition results, the other way around, tell us anything we don't already know about auditory processing? So, you know, we'll see. So, uh, what I'd like to do is start by reviewing some of the major physiological, psychophysical results that motivate the models. I'll, I'll do this pretty quickly since uh, I'm talking to an expert audience here and all of you know most of this stuff or have already heard it before. Um, uh, I'll briefly discuss, uh, review and discuss some of the classical auditory models of the 1980s which was the first renaissance for physiologically motivated processing. Uh, Stephanie Seneff, Dick Lyon, Oded Gitze uh, are the ones that come to mind. Uh, and then talk about some major new trends in today's models and talk about some representative issues that have driven our own work in, in, in recent years. So here's robust speech recognition <laughs> circa 1990. Uh, you should recognize the guy on the left here. <laughs> Some of you may not know, uh, this is Tom Sullivan, uh, hockey player. <laughs> uh, and on the right is uh, Aki Oshima. Uh, Tom, and, uh, Tom and Aki had uh, actually had a band with a couple of other students, uh, Dean Rubine. In fact, at one time I had a fantasy of forming a rock group with my grad students. Uh, that never got off the ground. Another year I had the fantasy of running the Pittsburgh Marathon as a relay team with all my grad students. Uh, that never happened either. But uh, nevertheless, uh, they did do some interesting work in speech recognition. Alex, of course, 
uh, was focused on statistical approaches that uh, enabled us to uh, use some nonlinear processing to improve uh, recognition accuracy in situations where we had both noise and filtering. Um, this is, uh, Tom did early work on array processing uh, that motivated some of the work that we had now. And Aki did early work on physiologically motivated processing. Uh, so, uh, and that pretty much gives you kind of a good idea of some of the things we were looking at circa 1990. Paul, when were you there? I, I forget your dates. So, uh, Paul's another former student of mine, but he was wise enough to. Okay. Uh, and, and you did your PhD thesis on correlation yeah. using silicon with Rick Carley. Yeah. With a, yeah, a topic close to my mind. I'd, uh, yeah, so that, that, was, that was Windows 95. So uh, fast forward uh, 10 years, and uh, what do we get here? We get... Uh, uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I think I did sit in that desk. Uh, th this was Mike in his big hair days. That's really cute. Is this why you were late making your slides? No. <laughs> 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 is that a wig or is that Photoshop? Um, That's what I call masking. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, I was inspired by the guys next door to use digital imagery to tell a story. Uh, the truth is I didn't have a photo. Uh, Mike actually did occupy the same desk. Uh, and uh, he, he did sit there. Uh, and that's not too unreasonable because Tom apparently took the better part of 10 years to finish. Uh, and Aki was uh, returning regularly. It's because he, he was more invested in hockey, I think, than uh, speech recognition. <laughs> but, uh, and, and he's still actually here. So it's a pseudo-realistic shot. Uh, anyway, uh, and th this, is, uh, this is Mike, I, I, actually, right? Yeah, that is Mike. I don't have those genes for the record. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I did a little bit of image modification. It was, it was subtle. So if you look hard, you can detect it. Anyway, uh, another ten, and, and what was going on during that time is uh, Mike, of course, did very interesting work, uh, again, uh, using array processing from a different standpoint. Uh, other students at the time, probably the big, uh, best known one was uh, Bikshaw Raj, uh, who did uh, seminal work in, in um, missing feature recognition before moving on to Merle and later back to CMU. Bikshaw and Paul worked, uh, were, were in the same place at the same time. I don't know how much you worked together, but he talked about you very... Uh, very, very lovingly, yeah, yeah. Uh, also, of course, uh, Juan Huerta was working uh, on uh, telephone speech recognition with uh, money uh, that we had from Alex's old group from Telefonica. Uh, let's see, who else was there? Then Pedro Moreno uh, extended uh, Alex's work developing the VTS algorithm with Big Sharaj, uh, still widely used. And uh, let's see, uh, I'm forgetting all of them. But anyway, uh, we did a, a bunch of other stuff then. Uh, and, um, and uh, now, 10 years later, uh, this is our, our third uh, Microsoft employee, except that the INS hasn't figured out that he's a Microsoft employee yet. Uh, but uh, they will. This is uh, Yusheng Bosco Chu. And his last day at his desk, the same desk, I might add. Uh, uh, <laughs> you recognize that? <laughs> he cleaned it up because he spent the previous week uh, shipping everything in, in like two boxes. Uh, this, this, is, this is very much the end game. Uh, this, this, of course, must be his offer from Microsoft. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, uh, during that time, Bosco and his uh, cohort, uh, Chan Woo Kim, uh, uh, we, we've been focusing more on, on, on um, methods uh, that were related to perception and production of sound, kind of going back to our roots in that sense. And uh, I have another student, Ziad Boab, who's now at Yahoo, who is working on uh, speech production approaches. And uh, another student, Lingwin Gu, uh, working on another form of uh, signal separation. So we have uh, many years, uh, same desk. Uh, uh, and you know, whoever occupies the desk next will, in another 10 years, uh, it'll be here someday. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that I will be, but <laughs> we'll see. So I don't need to tell you all too much about this. This is uh, standard uh, you know, auditory anatomy cold from the web. We don't need to draw pictures anymore because we have this uh, most important thing. Uh, air comes in, the tympanic membrane moves here. These are a bunch of levers. And then the uh, tympanic membrane, uh, I'm sorry, tympanic membrane back here moves the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup to unload the cochlea. And I used to have these, uh, you know, um, 
uh, diagrams by Bill Rohde, in fact, uh, about cochlear mechanics. We don't do that anymore because uh, now we have uh, glitzy animations. At least I thought we did. Let's see. There we go. This I also didn't do. I got it from the web. But how appropriating. This tells you what goes on inside. Pretty cool, huh? So here we are with a view of the cochlea. The cochlea now uncoils, and we look at the basilar membrane, and now see what happens when we play individual tones. Now a chord. And finally, something really complex. Well, it goes on for a while. Uh, I should really credit where that came from, and to be truthful, I'll have to go back and look. Uh, but but uh, I, I stole it without attribution, obviously, uh, uh, from a website. If you look up, uh, you know, cochlear animation or something like that, you will find it too. Uh, and I apologize for that. Um, we'll spend a few more minutes uh, talking about um, um, a couple of representative physiological results. Uh, this was a uh, curve that was showing the relative. So after the cochlea, and again, the important thing there that I hope that you saw was that there's a so-called pitch-to-place transformation uh, that takes place. Uh, the uh, mechanics that give rise to this are have been studied extensively. Uh, basically, the basilar membrane, which is a, a, a membrane inside the cochlea, uh, it has uh, stiffness that varies as you move along it and also a, uh, a density that varies as you move along it so that different locations have different resonant frequencies. There are many other nonlinear mechanisms that come into play that I won't even attempt to characterize. Uh, but the short end of the story is that, again, uh, it, the input is here, the output is here. The uh, high-frequency sounds excite this end of the thing. Low-frequency sounds pretty much excite the whole thing, but more over here than, than back here. And, and that's sort of what you saw. Uh, now, stuck to the cochlea, I'm sorry, stuck to the basilar membrane are tens of thousands of fibers of the auditory nerve. And one uh, each enervating a local region in the cochlea, and when they move, uh, they excite a neural pulse that gets piped on upstairs through the brain stem, ultimately to the brain. Uh, this is a uh, uh, sufficiently reduced description that any physiologist would cringe, but uh, it's, it's all that we need uh, to talk about here because uh, we don't go very far. Uh, this is the response that shows the relative number of firings uh, statistically. This is from the uh, group that Nelson Kang led, uh, and this is from the 65 treatise from uh, Eaton Peabody Lab at MIT, but what I, uh, the signal is a tone burst uh, that goes on for here, and what I want you to be uh, observant of is that there's a, a burst of activity, then it settles, settles down more or less to a steady state, and then when it's off, it, there's a depressed amount of activity, then it kind of comes back up to a spontaneous baseline level. So you get kind of uh, enhancement of onset and offset uh, as well as response. Um, as you saw before, the uh, uh, individual, uh, the, the cochlea is uh, frequency selective. Uh, this mapping is preserved in the auditory nerves. These are so-called tuning curves, and each one of these curves represents a different fiber of the auditory nerve and shows the intensity needed to elicit a criterion response as a function of frequency. And what's important here, note that we have a log scale, is that the units are frequency selective. The, the fact that the triangles are roughly the same shape at high frequencies indicates that the uh, filters, as, as they were, are approximately constant Q at high frequencies. It looks like they're stretching at low frequencies, but that's a consequence of the log scale. They're approximately constant bandwidth at uh, low frequencies. Is that the right scale? It seems like it went all the way up to 50 kilohertz. Uh, well, it does. These are cats. Uh, and uh, cats have smaller ears. They have everything kind of scales proportionally. Uh, I, there's a lot more I could have said about the experiment, uh, but all, all, all of the physiological data are, are uh, you know, are, are cats. Or, uh, yeah, and these are all cats. But, and, and they do indeed have a higher frequency scale. Uh, this is a so-called rate intensity curve. And what we're looking at is intensity. Uh, this is actually with the firing rate. Is, this is spontaneous rate on top of this, which has been subtracted off. And uh, all that I want to say about this is that it's roughly S-shaped. Uh, there's an area in the middle uh, where it's approximately linear with respect to the log of intensity. Uh, this linearity curve uh, 
actually is one of the motivating things that gives rise to the decibel scale, uh, which also codes things that are linear spectral intensity. Um, not the only thing, though. And there's a cutoff region here, and there's a saturation here. Uh, some units saturate more than others. That's a discussion I'm not going to get into right now. Yvonne? The numbers 2.1, 1.6, 2.3 uh, those are different frequencies. Those are uh, best frequency of response, uh, and those are in kilohertz. Uh, there's nothing. Uh, this thing actually, um, the fibers vary in the response with respect to what frequency they're most sensitive to. Uh, they also have different spontaneous rates of firing, and if anything, that has more to do with the ultimate shape uh, than anything else. And, uh, you know, kind of since the time that I've paid a lot of attention to this, there's big discussion about inner versus outer hair cells are two populations that have somewhat different properties. Uh, but that goes beyond a level of complexity that the average auditory model for speech recognition takes into account and, uh, in the interest of finishing before the sun sets. And it's a long day in spring. Uh, I think, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll omit some of those details. Uh, let's see, what else can we say? Oh, yeah, that's going backwards. It's because I'm inept. Um, over here, we're looking at uh, response to pure tones. And uh, at uh, low frequencies, well, 1,100 hertz is a low frequency for a cat. And uh, what's important here is that the relative number of firings is, the, uh, you know, if you have a sufficiently low frequency sound, it's, they, they're not only, they don't just occur randomly, uh, but they're actually synchronized to the phase of the incoming signal. And uh, this is very important because that's the major cue that enables us to uh, uh, keep track of cycle by cycle variability, uh, which obviously is needed to determine differences in arrival time uh, for binaural hearing. Again, something dear to my heart. Um, these studies, uh, that ability to respond in a synchronous fashion disappears uh, as you get above a certain frequency. And we have every reason to believe that that's uh, cued to, uh, again, the size basically animals with big heads uh, uh, lose the ability to follow phase information at lower frequencies. Uh, cats, uh, we uh, as humans, uh, uh, we infer through psychophysical experiments, lose that ability at about one kilohertz. And cats uh, maintain that with smaller heads up to a higher frequency. We have every reason to believe that that's keyed to, uh, you lose that information when that would become confusing uh, due to spatial aliasing considerations. If you have a delay that's longer than half a wavelength, uh, then you'll, you'll get, uh, uh, you know, unhelpful encoding of time delay. Uh, okay, this just repeats what I already said, doesn't it? So we'll skip that. Uh, this is a phenomenon uh, called lateral suppression or two-tone suppression. Uh, first uh, done by uh, uh, Murray Sachs, who was a student of Nelson Kang. Uh, his student, Eric Young, who's uh, very active still at Johns Hopkins. Uh, Murray is near retirement. Uh, is there. Anyway, the idea here, this, this is a tuning curve as we saw before for a, 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 a particular unit with a characteristic frequency about 7 or 8 kilohertz. Uh, it's being, uh, there's a signal at that frequency, a probe tone that's uh, 10 dB uh, above the threshold for that unit. And the shaded areas show combinations of frequencies and intensities for which the presentation of a second tone will inhibit the response to the first tone. Uh, this is very interesting because many of these frequencies uh, I'm sorry, many of these combinations are at uh, frequencies and intensities that are such that if the second tone were presented by itself, there'd be no response to it. So a second tone, even sub-threshold at an adjacent frequency will inhibit the response to a primary tone at the frequency. Um, I, uh, I'm not going to say much more about this, but I believe that this enables you to get a sharper frequency response without losing temporal resolution. Uh, and so it's a, another way. Um, uh, this is the results of a psychoacoustic experiment. I won't go into great detail about it. There's uh, a long demo that if I had two hours to lecture, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd play for you, but I won't now. And uh, basically, uh, it's, in, it's our, uh, results of several studies that have the goal of estimating the effective bandwidth of frequency resolution as a function of frequency. The fact that this is linear at high frequencies implies, as before, that the system uh, perceptually measured is constant Q just as the physiological results indicated. Uh, and um, uh, it's a little bit harder to infer what's going on down here. Some estimates have them becoming constant. Some continue to have them decrease. But roughly speaking, uh, we get the same kind of functional dependence of resolution bandwidth as a function of uh, channel center frequency that we observed from the physiological data. Bandwidth increases with center frequency. 
uh, and uh, the solid curve, this one here, is the so-called equivalent rectangular bandwidth. That's one of three frequency scales that have been used. Um, uh, one of the things that you'll encounter fairly frequency, frequently uh, are attempts to characterize the uh, dependence of bandwidth on center frequency, uh, which basically, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, suggests that resolution is, is finer f with respect to frequency at low frequencies than at high frequencies. Um, we believe that the reason for this is that you want to have good frequency resolution uh, at low frequencies because this enables us to uh, uh, attend to format frequencies which change, which we need to be able to do for vowel perception. Uh, the existence of broad frequency channels at high frequencies enables us to uh, develop very uh, sharp temporal resolution, uh, which is important for uh, certain constant discriminations, voice-on-voice uh, -voice detections. So by Building a system that's narrow in frequency at, low, at the low end, we get good frequency resolution at the low end, uh, good for vowels, uh, good time resolution at the high end, good for consonants, and uh, you have a system that's uh, optimized uh, for both. So it seems like a sensible thing to do. Uh, these three representations, the Bark scale, the Mel scale, and the ERB scale, um, uh, were developed uh, in Bark by uh, Eberhard Zwicker in, in uh, Deutschland. Uh, and the Mel scale by Smitty Stevens, uh, Mel actually, I found out many years later, I thought it was a guy named Mel, but it isn't. It's a shorthand for melody. Uh, I, I finally had to look up the original paper, and it's in a footnote there. Uh, how many of you knew that? <laughs> Probably not a lot. Uh, anyway, uh, that's what the M from uh, MFCC coefficients comes from. Now you know. Uh, ERB you just saw was equivalent rectangular bandwidth. Uh, it was from uh, Brian Moore, who's seems to publish a paper a month in JASA for the last 30 years, uh, but uh, that was one of them. Uh, these are plots of the MEL scale, the ERB scale, and the, and, and the, um, the BARC scale, and they're normalized for amplitude. They look kind of the same. If you manipulated the variance of the green curve, it would do a pretty good job of laying top of the red and the blue curve. So uh, the bottom line, as far as I'm concerned, is that all of these more or less do the same thing doesn't matter which one you use, but everybody seems to have their favorite. Uh, frankly, I don't think it affects recognition accuracy much at all. But so where does Bark come from? Uh, uh, Barkhausen <laughs> is, is an individual. Yeah, it's the name of somebody. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a contraction. Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who he is or what he did, but that's what it's from. Uh, okay. Uh, and the last one, equal loudness curves. Uh, these are the uh, Fletcher-Munson curves, uh, early psychophysical measurements from the 1920s, showed absolute sensitivity as a function of frequency. Uh, at higher intensities, the uh, intensity curve uh, saturates. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, frequency analysis in parallel channels, preservation of temporal fine structure, limited dynamic range in individual channels. I, I should have made more of a to-do about this, but when we saw the rate intensity curve, all of those curves went from threshold to saturation within about 20 or 25 dB. And uh, that's actually uh, a remarkable paradox uh, because, of course, uh, you and I have a dynamic range of uh, about 100 dB, uh, depending on where we look and how we count. Uh, and the fact that you can do that with individual fibers uh, says a lot about the fact that we look at this picture very, very holistically, which is something that computers aren't so good at doing, uh, but it's of, of interest. Enhancement of temporal contrast, enhancement of spectral contrast at uh, onsets and offsets and adjacent frequencies. And uh, most of these physiological attributes have psychophysical correlates. In fact, I would say all of them. Uh, it took, you know, some were discovered in the 1920s and some were not discovered until the 1970s, are not confirmed, but um, basically uh, uh, everything that I've talked about seems to be relevant for perception. Uh, the question is, is it helpful for speech recognition? And I don't have a complete answer for these, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some partial answers. And uh, most physiological and psychophysical effects are not preserved in conventional representations of speech recognition. So uh, that's the uh, point of departure. Uh, I'm not going to insult any of you by going through my usual walk through malfrequency coefficients, uh, Kepsler coefficients. So. Uh, uh, it just suffices to say for those of you who aren't familiar with the speech processing that uh, we take the input speech, uh, multiply it by a Hamming window, typically about 20, 25 uh, milliseconds. 
Uh, typically Hamming doesn't have to be. Uh, do a Fourier transform, take the magnitude of that. Uh, weight that triangularly with respect to frequency, and that's supposed to be a crude representation of uh, the frequency specificity. Take the log of that and take the inverse Fourier transform of that, and you get these things called MEL frequency capsule coefficients. The MEL comes from the fact that these triangular filters are spaced nonlinearly, originally according to the MEL scale. And uh, this was first proposed by uh, a pair of researchers at Bell, uh, Bell Northern, Davis and Mermelstein. Uh, what was it, around 1972? Paper was 82? 82? 82. Davis. Davis and Mermelstein, yeah. 82. 82. 82. I knew it had a 2 in it, not to mention a 1 and a 9. <laughs> the, uh, anyway, um, so let's take a look at what comes out. So this is an, an original speech spectrogram. Uh, I know you can all read this. Uh, I took a course from Victor Zhu once in 1985 teaching me to read this, and what it tells me is that it's me speaking. Actually, that you can't tell from that, but what you should be able to tell is it's the, the utterance is welcome to DSP1. And this is an example, so here's the SP1 uh, is over there. And uh, this is the uh, spectrum recovered from male frequency capsule coefficients. And uh, you know, if I take off my glasses, and I'm pretty damn nearsighted, and walk to the back of the room, uh, I, I'll get the same thing. Uh, but the general idea is that it's fairly blurry compared to the original uh, uh, MEL uh, wideband spectrogram. Now, in all fairness, part of that blurriness was deliberate because this was designed to get rid of these striations, uh, which correspond to pitch. It, that was considered to be not part of what was interesting. But uh, nevertheless, it's blurry. Uh, some of the aspects of fundamental auditory processing that are preserved are the frequency selectivity and the spectral bandwidth, so that it, the analysis is narrower at low frequencies than at high frequencies, so that's consistent with physiology. However, the, because of the fact that we use a window of constant duration, we don't really take advantage of the opportunity to exploit uh, better temporal resolution uh, at, at the high frequencies. We basically throw that away. It's an opportunity lost. Um, wavelet schemes exploit time frequency resolution better, less atlas and, and our own native land of Washington, Seattle, uh, has looked at this a bit. Uh, but um, I think it's fair to say that Wavelet analysis has not had a big impact on Speech Recognition Act uh, so far. Otherwise, we'd all be using it, and we're not. Uh, so it's gotten no better uh, results, and it's uh, less simple. So people are continuing to do what they have been. Uh, also, there is the, the nonlinear amplitude response is encoded in the logarithmic transformation that was part of the MELCAP representation. There are a bunch of aspects of auditory processing that are not represented. Uh, one of them is the detailed timing structure, lateral suppression, <coughs> enhancement of temporal contrast, and other auditory nonlinearities. And the list can go on and on. I, I just am running out of space here. It's PowerPoint. Uh, and uh, so we'll take a look. Now, interest in the auditory system began, well, I mean, uh, people have always been interested in the auditory system. But um, potential interest in applying this to speech processing began in the 1980s. There were a few seminal models, uh, one of uh, which, which we actually looked at in the 90s, was, or later 80s, was that of Stephanie Seneff. This was her PhD thesis before she went on to work in natural language processing. And um, basically, it assumed uh, stage one was a, a, a filter bank, a critical band filter bank. Uh, stage two was a hair cell model, which included the nonlinearities and a couple of uh, temporal things like uh, short-term AGC. Uh, and then there was a combination of envelope detector and synchrony detector. The envelope detector was kind of like an energy detector, and the synchrony detector was like a sync, well, that, that actually looked for the synchronization that I talked about before. Uh, and if you blow up the second stage, you get a saturating half-wave rectifier, short-term AGC, a low-pass filter, and another AGC. It was basically, all of these things are computational approximations to what the physiologists observe. Uh, and uh, it was used uh, among all of the early ones. This is the one that people studied the most. And frankly, uh, the reason was that Steffi gave her code away uh, so everybody could use it. And uh, it's a lesson about open source uh, that it was, it was helpful. Uh, Oded Gitze had a, uh, I wouldn't say a competing model, but a complementary model that uh, the interesting thing about that was, uh, again, there's a filter bank. And what was different was they had a lot of different thresholds and level crossings associated with that. But by the time you looked at everything and you were done with it, you had something that looked fairly similar to what you would have gotten with the Senef model. 
uh, and similar, uh, there we go. Uh, similarly, Dick Lyon, who at that point originally was at Fairchild, but later with Apple, uh, uh, had uh, a, a, again, a set of bandpass filters that are kind of off the page. Uh, a, a more detailed model of what was going on after that, including a stage that explicitly modeled lateral suppression. So uh, he also uh, included uh, autocorrelation display. Uh, this led to this popular uh, correlograms, uh, and also introduced the idea of cross-correlation uh, as, uh, as, as a mechanism for auditory lateralization. Uh, and he was really ahead of the curve in, in the autocorrelation and cross-correlation. I should mention that cross-correlation is supported by physiology. The autocorrelation is really not, uh, to my knowledge. I think Jordan Cohen also did the work for IBM at that time. Jordan, Jordan Cohen, his PhD thesis was pitch, a model of pitch. Uh, and it, used, it also used autocorrelation. He, he, he finished around 1982. And, and indeed, that was contemporaneous with all of this. Uh, but um, I, I didn't include that because I didn't think that the model had anything that the previous models didn't have. Uh, and his work particularly was focused on pitch perception. Um, I met Jordy actually the first time at the 82 ICAST, which was in Paris, and uh, he was presenting his work there. It's also when I met Dick Lyon, and Senna, if I'd known from before, of course. We, we were a year apart at MIT. But, um, and Victor Zhu was my TA in DSP. Um, that was when he was a grad student. I was, a, well, we both were grad students. Anyway, um, one of the reasons why uh, the Senna model did not catch the world of fire uh, was this one here. This was an analysis of the number of multiplications per millisecond. Uh, and on the left, you have the various stages of the Senef model. And over here, we have LPC processing. And uh, uh, MFCC processing was comparable to uh, uh, LPC, pro uh, LPC processing at the time, so you could uh, assume that it was about the same. So that was a... Um, that was a deterrent. And this was, keep in mind, in the 1980s, Computers were not very powerful, uh, not very uh, big. I, I, I remember I was describing somebody, I spent about, oh God, it was about six or seven thousand dollars to get this big disk. It was, came, it was about this size, a Winchester drive, and it was eight megabytes. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it was this wide and took a whole thing and had, it was hermetically sealed. It was, you know, <laughs> you may remember that disk. It, it had its own, it was in the, uh, uh, the hearing lab. Anyway, um, so to summarize what was going on before, uh, the models developed in the 1980s included, you know, kind of realistic auditory filtering, realistic auditory nonlinearities, and sort of in quotes, synchrony extraction, lateral suppression, I I again, uh, higher order processing through autocorrelation, cross-correlation. Uh, this is if you look across the ensemble of models. Uh, every system developer had his or her own uh, private idea of uh, what was important. And uh, this, this varied quite a bit from person to person. And um, uh, that was, you know, uh, it, you know, so, you know, clearly there was no consensus. And uh, there was no one of quantitative evaluation actually performed. Uh, typically, the paper would say, we have this thing, and then they'd show you a display of like one sentence uh, and say, see how much better this looks than a, anything else. And I can understand this. I mean, it was really hard to do a good job with this because everything was so slow. Uh, and uh, so I, I, you know, I have an appreciation of that. When we actually did get around to evaluating this, and this was uh, in part Aki Oshima's PhD thesis, uh, what we found was the following. Uh, physiological processing didn't help at all, uh, or certainly not much if you had clean speech. Uh, it um, gave us some improvement if we had degraded speech, if we added noise or, or, or recorded things with a distant microphone, it was better. However, uh, the benefit that we got with physiological processing did not exceed what we could get with more prosaic approaches such as CDCN, uh, uh, you know, which was Alex's PhD thesis. Uh, I don't know how much you hear about CDCN these days, but uh, it still shows up in, in, our, in our stuff. But in any case, uh, we would do better with much lower computational cost uh, just being good engineers and uh, forgetting about the physiology. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it, it was disappointing, but true, and we couldn't ignore that reality. Uh, there are also other reasons why they didn't work so, uh, why, why they weren't so successful. One of them 
was that in those days, the conventional state-of-the-art recognition system was either DTW uh, using uh, conventional, uh, I don't know, just, just using a conventional uh, you know, distance metric, or HMMs using, uh, in, in those days, Kai Fuli's thesis was uh, uh, single density, uh, you know, discrete HMMs. And these all implicitly assumed univariate Gaussians. The uh, distributions of the features that came out were very non-Gaussian. Uh, and so there wasn't a good statistical match. Uh, ben Shigie in ICASP, or I Interspeech, uh, well, I guess in those days it was ICSLP, uh, 1992 in Banff, remember we shared a room? Uh, watched the uh, last game of the National League playoffs in 1992. Yes, uh, so we did, we were there. The, the Braves defeated the Pirates. Francisco Cabrera knocked in Sid Bream, former Pirate. Uh, in 92, immediately thereafter, Barry Bonds went to uh, San Francisco and Bobby Bonilla went to the Mets. And Pittsburgh never finished above 500 after that, including now. So we're well beyond 500. Anyway, uh, more interestingly, uh, Ben Shigia had a paper in which he compared uh, physiological approaches to uh, uh, conventional melcaps, uh, both with uh, conventional HMM and with a neural network classifier. And the physiological model really shown with the neural net classifier because uh, the neural net could learn the densities, uh, whereas uh, in those days at least, the HMMs assumed Gaussian densities. Nowadays, of course, we all use Gaussian mixtures, uh, which in principle uh, you know, can model any shape, so that, that's of less relevance. Uh, also, frankly, uh, the more pressing need was to solve other basic speech recognition problems. How do you do large vocabularies? How do you integrate language models? This was really kind of a boutique kind of thing. Uh, so uh, there wasn't a lot of attention paid to it. It was kind of a niche market and, uh, you know, it consumed a lot of cycles, didn't provide any benefit, but uh, so it was a small coterie of aficionados. Okay, so uh, nevertheless, in the late 1990s, Renaissance. A uh, number of reasons for that. Uh, one of them was that um, uh, the computation no longer was a big deal. Uh, wasn't uh, not as much before. Uh, there was uh, other attributes, serious attention paid to temporal evolution. A lot of work in modulation filtering uh, became very popular. Uh, uh, attention also paid to reverberation, uh, which was uh, not as obvious a problem uh, in, in the old days, but once people started deploying systems in real rooms, if you weren't going to wear a close talking microphone, uh, that to my mind was for, uh, you know, in, in some ways at least as challenging, if not more challenging than noise. And uh, also, uh, binaural processing uh, became part of the mix, which is, uh, to my mind, a good thing. Um, and more effective and more mature approaches to information fusion as well. I, I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but it, it's also, I believe, uh, one of the factors that's motivating the increased popularity. So by, binaural uh, processing, you meant microphone array? Is it? No. Uh, Two oh, okay. Well, I, actually, I don't even mean that. I, I just mean two microphones. Oh, just, okay. two microphones. Uh, just two microphones. But, uh, but you're, you're right, strictly speaking, uh, you, you, binaural recordings with the head. But uh, most of us don't want to have a device with a head on it. Uh, and so, again, I, I'm trying to be pragmatic. What, what, what can we appropriate from what we learn about the system in order to improve performance and uh, without necessarily uh, overly slavish regard to physiological or anatomical details like heads and ears and so forth. Oh. Yeah. So in this area, do people take advantage of neural physiology to design for microphone? At a very first, uh, we can exploit things by exploiting in, uh, interval time delay. So by the way, Mike, um, I'm looking at the clock. Uh, I note that the time was budgeted for 90 minutes, which is 50% more than I thought it would be. Uh, is everybody going to leave at 5? Uh, or four, rather? At four? At well, four? no, typically it's 4.30. Four, 4.30. Oh, yeah, no, 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 we'll finish by 4.30. Yeah. What I, uh, my question is, do I need to worry about four? No, no. no. okay. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, um, so let's talk a little bit about what, we, what we've been doing lately. Uh, last, eh, this more or less for the last six or seven years. Uh, I'll talk a bit about, and unfortunately I'm not going to be able to talk about these in equal uh, levels of detail, but I'll be happy to stand as, as long as you have patience after we're done to answer questions. Uh, representation of synchrony, shape of the rate intensity function, revisiting analysis duration, frequency resolution, onset enhancement, uh, modulation filtering I'm not going to say very much about, but I can comment on. 
uh, and binaural and polyoral techniques, as, as well as uh, uh, techniques derived from scene, auditory scene analysis uh, based on auditory frequency, common frequency modulation. So uh, this is uh, another physiological result uh, by Eric Young and Murray Sachs. I mentioned before Murray Sachs was the guy who was behind, uh, uh, who first recorded consistently the lateral suppression effect that we saw before. In fact, that was his career before he went to Hopkins uh, Biomedical Engineering Department. Eric Young was a former student of his. He's now a big honcho there, as, as well as in the ARO and the ASA. And what we're looking at are physiological recordings of cats. They're being hit by uh, an artificial signal uh, that's actually a pseudo-vowel generated by a computer. It's basically sine waves with those intensities. This is a, uh, done in the late 70s when, you know, again, equipment was pretty primitive. And we're looking at the relative number of spikes as a function of, um, uh, in response to this, uh, average over time. And these things are, are, are um, uh, plotted according to the characteristic frequency. And if you look at the response uh, as a function of frequency, you get an estimate of what the response profile is. And uh, the panels, uh, and you probably can read them, but what we're looking at, the overall loudness changes from 28 dB to 78 dB. So it's, uh, you know, uh, 60 or 50, 50 um, you know, a range of about 50 dB in intensity. And uh, these three arrows, which you see occasionally, and I, I, they're kind of in odd positions because I got this by taking a picture and moving it around. But um, these, three, these three arrows are in those positions. They indicate the original you know, pseudo-format frequencies of uh, the original signal. And um, basically the story here is if you look at this and if you look at what happens over frequencies, uh, uh, it's a big mess. And uh, there's no invariance over intensity. And uh, it doesn't look like mean rate of firing is a very useful way of coding the spectral shape of the vowel that's coming in, uh, at least if you believe the results and based on that figure. Okay, so this was coding using uh, mean rate doesn't work, uh, at least physiologically. Uh, now, this is the same thing using something called an average localized synchrony rate. And what that was, uh, you saw earlier I talked about the fact that the response was synchronized to the phase of the signal coming in. The synchrony rate is a measure of the extent to which it's synchronized. So if the things occur randomly anywhere within the phase of the signal coming in, that uh, synchrony uh, measure is zero. And if it's completely lockstep to the phase coming in, that's going to be uh, uh, one. And uh, these are vertically displaced from each other. But the cute thing about this, again, we're looking over a range of intensities, uh, is that not only are the contours, including the format frequencies, very nicely preserved, but also uh, that the same, um, uh, but, but also that the uh, curve remains very invariant. So this suggests that uh, the synchrony is important. Uh, this, by the way, was taken up by Campbell Searle and Hugh Sackler-Walker, you may recall. Were they there when you were? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so that exceptional point that not have to do uh, Yeah, probably. <laughs> I, I, I forget exactly. I should look at that. Uh, the, the measure actually, uh, it, they weren't necessarily synchronized also, I should say, to the actual fundamental frequency. They would be synchronized to whatever the nearest harmonic was of the fundamental frequency. So that's a little somewhat bogus statistic. But uh, in any case, um, the important information, the, the, the implication, at least to me, is that uh, cues about the spectral content uh, you know, are, are certainly there in the synchronization uh, and better preserved. Uh, there than they are uh, in, in the mean rate. Now when we take a look at MELCAPS, really what that is, is that's a measure of short-term energy uh, in, as a function of a short-term time, measured as a function of frequency. So that's more like the mean rate, uh, which doesn't look very good at all. Yeah, so uh, the question is, you know, can we harness that? And the answer, by the way, I'm not going to keep you in suspense forever, is well, sort of. Uh, but uh, here is a uh, Fairly complicated model of signal processing. Uh, I forget Shang's first name. Do you remember? All right. Uh, uh, Carney is Laurel Carney, <laughs> who is a physiologist, used to be at BU, now runs a lab at Syracuse. Uh, Shang, uh, who I believe is a woman, uh, was a student of uh, Carney. Anyway, uh, they had this uh, fairly complicated model, which actually looked better on my screen than it does here. Uh, that has, uh, uh, which by the way we're also using because it's available in open source. 
Uh, the C code is right there uh, under Carney's lab, which makes it easy to exploit. Anyway, one of the things that we did is we just asked the question that uh, if we just took the output down here, uh, and this is one of the first things that Bosco did when he got to graduate school, uh, uh, if we just take the output down here and uh, use that as the basis, uh, do we do any better than, than, if we, than we would with mail caps uh, from that very complicated model? And this, by the way, was very slow. I mean, really, really, really slow. Even in 2006, it was really, really slow. Uh, much more complicated than Santos model. Uh, the boxes look simple, but they're, they're not. It's, it's slow. Uh, it's a careful physiological model. The, the general shape, uh, uh, this was Bosco's side, and this was Chanwu Kim's side. Chanwu was a fan of complexity. Uh, but uh, we did mean rate estimation, synchrony detection, looked at synchrony at low frequencies, uh, mean rate at high frequencies, uh, and then combined the two, uh, and, and then use that. Uh, in those days, it was very slow, mainly because, again, we were using the Carney auditory nerve model. And uh, these are results that we presented back in 2006. Uh, uh, if we look at some of these, uh, in the top curve, this is an original spectrogram. This is the reconstruction using male frequency capsule coefficients uh, in the fashion before. We just turned you know, the coefficients back into, uh, you know, back into something that looked like a spectrogram. And, and then down here, this is the auditory model. And you see, you know, with clean speech, you have this, you still have the formant trajectories kind of nicely and cleanly represented. Uh, as we go to 20 dB SNR, um, this, um, this and this start, you know, showing the effects of noise. Uh, this particularly at high frequencies, not because they're bad at high frequencies, but the filters are, have a wider bandwidth at high frequencies, so more noise gets into each channel. So this is just a... If we had pink noise, uh, this would be the same across the frequencies. Uh, but again, we still get you know, pretty good preservation of the contours uh, that we see before. Uh, say it again? There is synchrony model. Yeah, this is uh, but with mean rate and synchrony. That's right. So why is it that the fricative comes through uh, so much more strongly than anything else? There's no energy in the synchrony model. Uh, but you can see energy elsewhere. Well, it's, it's not. Yeah, it's not. Uh, you, you mean here? Yeah, here this is. Uh, all the uh, red colors that I, I think see it is. This is. Up there. I think this is an excerpt of the greasy wash water utterance. That's you know the dialect normalization sentence for Tibet. Uh, noise energy goes higher with the frequency. I say it again. Why the noise energy is with the frequency. It's higher in about 6, 7 kilohertz, down below 1,000. Usually it's the opposite. Uh, you know, I'd have to listen to the utterance. Uh, it, it might have been, you know, kind of very sibilant. Greasy, uh, you know, it really would depend on how it's pronounced. Uh, because it's quite a noise and it's equal in all frequencies. And when you go with the higher frequency, you, it has a wider bandwidth. Yes. Yeah. yeah. In fact, that, that's what I said a moment ago, by the way. But but he was so much more eloquent. <laughs> that was, uh, and and you can see that reflected in the fact that the noise shows up here as well. Uh, here you see it even more, 10 dB, and uh, I, again this is starting to get you know kind of really fuzz out, uh, whereas these are still pretty well preserved. Uh, and, uh, you know, down at zero dB, nothing works. And sooner or later that was going to happen, and, and, and that's where it did. So uh, now, now let's look at the um, Wall Street Journal task, uh, white noise and background music, and I fear that these might be mislabeled. Yes, they are. Uh, please interchange in your mind the green curve and the blue curve. I keep intending to do this, and I never do. Uh, but uh, the basic story is, and, and these were uh, results that uh, actually Bosco did, and, uh, and I think Chang would do some of them, uh, is that this is mean rate. Uh, this is um, the auditory represent. This, this is, I'm sorry, the blue, this curve is, uh, this curve and also this curve here uh, is um, malfrequency capsule coefficients. Uh, the green curve, uh, and again, I believe, the, the, the blue curve on the right side, despite the fact it's not labeled that way, is the auditory model with uh, mean rate only, and the red curve is mean rate plus synchrony. Uh, in this situation, the synchrony certainly did not give us, you know, a very, a, you know, very impressive uh, incremental advantage, especially in considering the amount of effort that it would take to calculate it, and which I'm 
skipping over some of the details. I, I don't regard this as a big success for synchrony. But uh, one of the things that we do see is that we see, you know, really a substantial difference uh, between uh, performance uh, with the auditory models uh, and everything else. Now, note, by the way, that that is diminished quite a bit when you have background music. Uh, in general, uh, white noise, we now understand, is really easy, uh, relatively speaking. And if you really want to uh, impress somebody, you've got to work in music. And also, you have to work in big tasks, too. Um, uh, yeah, so, so which, in your work, did you find any difference between artificially added noise versus the natural noise? Where you can't come on? Well, um, I, you know, I, I, I agree, and, and I'm not going to, you know, and the truth is that we did this with the artificially uh, added noise because uh, we had to. Uh, it, will have that say it again. Aura three. It's, well, it's natural noise. Uh, has it has natural? No, we've done other. Uh, well, there, there are two issues here. Uh, one is what's the noise source, and the other is how's the noise combined. So, as I understand it, I, I've done only limited work with uh, Aurora. Uh, as, as you know, we have various different noises, uh, you know, white noise, uh, background music from the old Hub Ford task, uh, various speech, and more recently, uh, we did some work for Samsung Electronics, and they actually went around with a microphone in a supermarket and a, you know, concert in an airport and a train station in the street and so forth. Uh, and also we've had natural noise samples from Telefonica from the work that they did, uh, also recording things. Um, the... Uh, in, in terms of the noise type, uh, things that are kind of quiescent are easy. Uh, so if you have white noise and colored noise, uh, it's, it's fairly trivial. Uh, if you have things that jump around a lot, uh, and I don't talk a lot about this in this talk, but I, you know, when I came here a few years ago, we, we talked more about that. Uh, for example, background music is much more difficult to compensate for than white noise, and that's partly because uh, you know, you get problems with the, you know, particularly with vocal music, with the music, with the background being confused with the foreground. Uh, but also that the classical compensation algorithms like CDC and VTS all began by sniffing a piece of the environment for about a second or so and then using that for the environmental parameters. And if the environment changes during that time, which it typically will uh, for that, uh, you know, that, you know it, it won't be helpful. In addition, impulsive things like timpani crashes or, for that matter, gunshots or impulsive noises in factory floors are particularly susceptible to not working well. Uh, missing feature techniques, such as the things that uh, Martin Cook did uh, in Sheffield and somewhat later, but we think better, uh, Big Shah Raj did uh, at, at Carnegie Mellon, uh, are, are more effective for impulsive noises. So there's, there's a big issue with noise type. Uh, then beyond that, there's the question of how is the noise added? Uh, probably the biggest issue with when you, is that when you digitally add noise, uh, you don't include any reverberant effects. And in the real world, unless you're, making your, unless you're measuring things in an anechoic chamber, uh, which especially in these, day, in these days is unusual, or perhaps outdoors, uh, which even there is not really perfectly anechoic at all, uh, that you're going to get echoes, and the echoes are going to really muck things up quite a bit, and that when you digitally combine things, as we do and as Aurora does, uh, you, you, you lose cognizance of that. So we've started to become more attentive to that, although, again, we calibrated in artificial situations using, you know, image model. Uh, but uh, we found that um, it's always worse in the real world, but that the things that we do for a particular and, and evaluate for will still provide benefit for comparable tasks. Um, so that's, uh, you know, I understand the concern and I share the concern. Uh, it's hard to do much about it. Well, artificial added noise, mathematically, you already can show that doing synchrony, you can get rid of noise. Just the other correlation can get rid of noise. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, natural yeah. noise is, is what I want to show. So I think the parent way. It is natural noise, it's just the mixing. Not the mixing, yeah. Naturally mixing noise. I mean, the well, noise is more like the lumber effect. Yeah. Is that our speakers talking louder when they perceive noise? Are they changing their formats? But the noise is real noise, it's not something yeah. they can generate. Well, well, these were... It's more of an issue if it's a microphone array thing where you can yeah. have these trivial algorithms that you can do it. Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't have any trivial algorithms. <laughs> no, I mean, we don't, we don't exploit anything. No, no, none of these are... That's a case where it makes a big difference. Yeah. For noise, yeah. all the experiments that I've run show that the, it was very, very good approximation. For microphone arrays, yeah. it's not true. Well, I think for microphone arrays, well, some of these things that you can get singular solutions for, uh, you, 
you know, you don't get the solutions when somebody's in the room and, and, and disturbing the model. I'm, I'm generally very skeptical of any algorithm that tries to invert anything. Uh, it's uh, because uh, all of these inversion techniques are very sensitive to numerical issues. They're very sensitive to having an exact model, which you're never going to have in a real environment. Uh, we, nev we never do that. Yeah. In the natural environment, sometimes the channel effect kind of mixed together with the editing. No, okay. So, so somehow, you know, there's a mix. Yeah. So let, let, let's continue for now, uh, just because uh, I have 250 slides and uh, we're only... <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. <laughs> I don't have that many. But I'm not going to tell you what the number is. <laughs> I know what it is. Uh, <laughs> and we have to go on to the next slide. <laughs> uh, anyway, a reasonable question. Do the auditory models have to be so damn complex? Uh, and uh, here's the Carney and Zhang model, or Zhang and Carney model. Uh, and here's the Chu model. Uh, or uh, this is uh, just an easy model when you have gamma tone filters followed by a nonlinear rectifier uh, and followed by a low pass filter. This is what we tried at the end, which is kind of uh, a very crude abstraction. In other words, taking this piece, maybe this piece, and this piece, and leaving everything else out of it, especially this stuff over here. And if we just did that, how would we do? And uh, the answer is, well, pretty good. Uh, this is malfrequency capsule coefficients. Uh, this is the simple auditory model. And this is the more complicated auditory model. And so the, uh, this is one of these half empty, half full situations. I mean, uh, on the one hand, uh, you're still doing really well on the basis of almost zero computation compared to, uh, uh, compared to just using mil caps. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, if you really want to spend a lot more cycles, you can do better. And, uh, you know, the question uh, that drives, you know, our work these days is, can we do better without spending that many cycles? And in order to do that, we have to have a deeper understanding of what's going on than simply plugging in somebody else's code uh, at great expense computationally and then running it into our, our analyzers. So... Do you still see improvements from this adaptation? Uh, do we still see improvements when there's a uh, you know, speaker adaptation loop? Uh, excellent question. I don't know. We should try it. Uh, it's equivalent to asking the question if you do match training, right? Yeah. That's a simpler version of that question. And the answer is it's hard to beat that. Yeah. <laughs> right? Well, you can do MFCC match training at 10 dB. And I bet you get a much better number. Uh, we would. This, these, these were all trained clean. Uh, uh, which was our religion, based from your days. Uh, uh, we're, uh, you know, moving away from that. And I, I will show you some results from Aurora, uh, using the Aurora paradigm, uh, in a moment. Um, but uh, th that's a good question, and, and the truth is, I don't know. Uh, you know, we'll find out. Uh, the one thing I can tell you is, uh, once again, that uh, we did one specific piece of work for Samsung, uh, in which um, uh, we, uh, you know, basically, basically, it w wasn't exactly the paradigm we're talking about here. Uh, it was actually a much bigger task and more realistic noises. But the things that were that I'm describing worked uh, in in that practical environment. They may not be the best thing to do, but can we? We're not completely doing what you would consider to be the right experiments. Uh, one obvious question to ask is, uh, you know, in, in those models, you know, what really is important? And uh, this is a, um, this is actually a part of Bosco's thesis. And what we're looking at is we're looking into various different stages of the uh, Santa Fe auditory model, looking at performance, and this is now recognition accuracy rather than uh, error rate uh, as a function of uh, SNR going in the other direction from which you would expect it to, which is why the curve is going down. Uh, but uh, just the quick interpretation of this is that uh, if you include an appropriate saturating half-wave rectifier, uh, then you get good results. Uh, and if you don't, uh, you, get, you get bad results. Or, uh, so what that these the are the good... Well, we'll talk about that. Um, so... The previous slide doesn't belong there. Uh, what this rect rectifier does is the follows. So this is um, plotting log intensity and out output on a linear scale 
uh, a logarithmic transformation, this is what's implied by uh, you know, the conventional log transformation uh, in malfrequency capsule coefficients, is a straight line. The, um, this curve is kind of an abstraction of uh, actually the curve that emerged from the um, Shang and Carney model. Is that correct? Uh, from the model. From the Senate model. Yeah, just the okay. The Sorry about that. Thank you for the correction. Anyway, uh, the idea is that, for example, a 20 dB SNR, which of course is relatively benign, uh, the speech kind of sits here in the graded portion of the curve, and the noise sits down here. Uh, and so when you have noise by itself, uh, you're there, and the contribution of the noise is, is uh, relatively small. So you reduce the variability uh, produced by the noise. And um, this is, uh, again, from Bosco's thesis, a uh, comparison of uh, frequency response, uh, or as a function, this is channel index, but read by that frequency, that's a marker for frequency. Uh, this is uh, uh, clean speech and noisy speech. The effect of the noise, of course, is to fill in the valleys in the representation. And by using the nonlinearity, uh, you still get some effect, of course, but the uh, correspondence is much closer. So uh, that, that, seems, that seems to be helpful. Um, this is a uh, comparison of... Um, Recognition accuracy obtained, uh, and this is actually on the Aurora uh, test set. Which, uh, this is, thank you, Mike. Uh, and uh, this is test set A, uh, and it was trained and tested, I, my understanding, is according to Aurora protocols. Uh, so, and what we're looking at, the, the dark red triangles are results using malfrequency capsule coefficients. Uh, the red triangles are using a baseline nonlinearity, kind of taken, I think in this case, from the other uh, model, sort of out of the box, just fitting a curve to the results of the physiological model. Carney and Shang this time? Also Senef? Yeah, I think it's Senef. Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, the blue curve was the uh, results that uh, Bosco was able to obtain uh, using a routine that automatically learned the characteristics of the nonlinearity or, uh, or found the characteristic of the nonlinearity that produced best performance. Is that in a maximum likelihood sense? So this is kind of whether it's... Uh, it's using the... Uh, Maximal MAT, just the maximal, it was to maximize people's steel probability. It's not, a, it's not using the maximal likelihood sense. It wasn't based on error rate. It's kind of, it's, in other words, it's operating in open loop fashion. Uh, so, you know, from the stuff oh, so it was adaptive, it was on something online to learn for the utterance. Uh, no, it was, it was done ahead of time. Yeah, it, it was done in batch. So it's maximizing the posterior of the correct sentence? No, it's uh, maximizing the um, posterior of the corresponding um, class in, in of the brain. Class? Yeah. <coughs> So it seems like a pretty important Meaning, and then you a school came performance with this as with MFCC, yet in most of the other results, that was MFCC is a bit better. <laughs> so what was the trick? Why, why, why were you getting the same? Or it looks like it's the same. Maybe if we zoom in, we still see a difference. I don't know. Are you talking about clean speech? Clean speech. I, clean speech. No, speech. I, MFCC is better, actually. Yeah, but, but this one is better. You have the numbers somewhere. I have your thesis on, you know, here if you, if you want to refer to it. But uh, let's hold off on that for now. Anyway, so, um, so the nonlinearity helps. I, I want to talk for a few moments about the analysis window duration. Uh, typical analysis window, uh, as you know, as we mentioned before, as you all know, is about 25 to 35 milliseconds for most speech recognition systems. In fact, sometimes I've seen it go down a little bit lower. Um, if you're doing, if you're trying to estimate, if you're trying to sniff the environment, uh, you're better off looking over a longer duration. Uh, typically, 75 to 125 milliseconds, depending on the particular application. And uh, this seems trivial in retrospect, but uh, you know, uh, up until now, we'd sort of been going frame by frame, everything we'd be doing. Uh, there's a pretty substantial win to be had just by looking over a longer window for estimating compensation parameters. 
and then drilling down to a shorter window. So basically you go frame by frame in a short duration frame, look over a longer window, then kind of move things forward. Uh, we're not the first people to have done this, of course, uh, but um, it, it is, um, it's not as commonly done as it should be. So I, I, I thought I'd make mention of that. When you say competition purposes, do you mean like online CMN or what kind of stuff? Well, we're doing, nowadays we're doing everything online. Uh, so we don't use CMN because CMN requires that you look at the whole utterance. Uh, so we only have, an, we only have an, a look ahead of about a frame or two. Uh, so that, uh, you know, and, and, and this is a real problem because a lot of things like voice activity detection are dependent on having a model for silence. And we're constantly worrying about how to update those models dynamically uh, based on, you know, uh, what things come in. And it's, it's a tough problem. Uh, anyway, in, in all of those, you know, kind of uh, adaptive parameter updates, typically the update will be based on what we observe over about 75 milliseconds. But it will be updated um, every frame, uh, which is every 10 milliseconds, of course. And the analysis will still be applied to, uh, you know, the actual speech recognition will still be done on, in a 25 millisecond frame. Or 20, 26.3 or whatever. It's, some, it's something that's an odd, uh, you know, something that derives from the sampling rate and the power, and power of two, you know, the way it is. But nominally somewhere between 20 and 25 milliseconds. So, uh, again, uh, that, that's something that's worth noting. Chen Wo Kim calls this uh, medium uh, duration or medium time windowing, I, I, I don't think it's that profound, but it, it's worth doing. And I see that we're also missing a closed paren, uh, maybe uh, over here is where it goes. Sorry about that. Um, frequency resolution. Uh, we looked at several different types of frequency resolution. There's the MFCC triangular filters. Uh, gamma tone filters are, are wider. And uh, originally, uh, we went in, in many of the original work, I, I, I indicated well, if you just take uh, the um, uh, malfrequency Kepsler coefficients and uh, increase the duration of the window, and increase the bandwidth of the window, rather, in other words, replace the uh, triangular window used in malfrequency Kepsler coefficients by gamma tone windows, you actually do better. Uh, in fact, fairly substantially better. However, uh, if you're also willing to go ahead and use uh, a different nonlinearity, uh, then um, if, if you're also willing to use a different nonlinearity, then the effect of the nonlinearity actually swamps the effect of the uh, window the, the, the bandwidth. So uh, it, it's something by not doing the right experiment, uh, we came to the wrong conclusion. We, we looked at uh, malfrequency triangular filters, gamma tone filters, uh, truncated gamma tone filter shapes, which is just gamma tones, but when the uh, weighting function gets down to a certain point, we just simply set it equal to zero. And uh, this is useful because Gamma tone windows actually go on for a long time, and if you're using them as waiting functions, by having them go on for long, uh, I should mean, for long range of frequencies, you're going to end up multiplying uh, lots and lots of numbers that you don't really uh, that don't really contribute much to anything. Uh, so that you can, uh, by using kind of a truncated gamma tone uh, frequency waiting function, you can get the effects of uh, waiting functions without that. Now there is one exception to this. Um, in, in certain situations, when you're using frequency select, so if you're doing a missing feature analysis, for example, in which you are selecting only a subset of time frequency bins for uh, representation, then uh, the role of the frequency uh, uh, smoothing, be th then there's a question of how do, you fill in, uh, how do you fill in the missing features. Now, really the best way to do this is using something like cluster-based analysis like Bikshar Raj did. But, uh, uh, if you don't want to spend all that time and energy in computation, uh, a much cheaper thing to do is to simply use uh, frequency weighting over frequency. And the effect of these uh, uh, frequency windows is basically to smear what you have. Uh, you're, in effect, convolving the frequency response that you have, which includes the missing components with the frequency response of the windows, which actually vary with frequency. But if you can imagine this kind of uh, frequency varying convolution, uh, uh, you, you gain a lot, and there having the wider resolution helps. I think in general, uh, I'm sorry, the, the broader frequency uh, that the gamma tones gives you helps. Uh, so I, I think in the, the broad range, I think in terms of everything, we do everything with gamma tone filters now. It never hurts. It helps in some situations. In a lot of situations, it doesn't make much difference. But that's what, that's what we have gleaned from that. Um, uh, effects of onset enhancement processing. This is the, a paper... 
Uh, again, that Chan Woo Kim uh, is doing it. I apologize for not having more details here, but it's, if anybody's curious about it, I'll send you the paper. It was just accepted for Interspeech 2010. <coughs> What's going on is that we have a, uh, a, a auditory-based model and uh, the usual frequency analysis, nonlinearity. And then after the nonlinearity, maybe before the nonlinearity, I need to check, uh, there's a mechanism that after the bandpass filtering, the nonlinearity, I think, uh, it, there's something that does a couple of things. One is that it, um, it takes a look at basically the envelope, uh, something that looks like the power envelope, and subtracts off the, uh, uh, basically causes the uh, falling edge to fall away very quickly. So what that means is that you pay a lot of attention to the rising edge of things, pay a lot less attention to the falling edge, and, uh, and um, uh, just interpreting the curves here, the baseline uh, MFCC curve is blue. Uh, Rasta PLP, with, and, and all of these have uh, Kepstel mean normalization. Uh, Rasta PLP is the red curve, which actually is worse than this. This, by the way, is uh, uh, music noise. Oh, geez, I wanted to show, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to show, uh, not resource management, but um, uh, uh, brought, uh, but um, uh, Wall Street Journal, we had numbers for that as well, uh, and, uh, but this is what we have. Anyway, um, uh, baseline MFCC with capsule mean normalization is here, uh, Rasta PLP with CMN is here, and just by doing uh, this stuff we get a, a, a bit of an improvement. Uh, again, I, I look at the horizontal displacement of these curves, and it's only a couple of dB, but um, more interestingly, in reverberation, we get a very big improvement in recognition accuracy. This is uh, simulated reverb time going from 0 to 1.2 seconds. Uh, again, doing nothing is down here, but adding this, uh, this, this SSF processing uh, gives us, uh, it still isn't great. I mean, we go down from 95% to 60% correct, but that's in uh, 1.2 milliseconds of reverb time. Uh, there is uh, much better preservation of uh, word accuracy as a function of reverb time by paying attention, by, by uh, getting, uh, getting rid of the stuff immediately after the first arriving thing. Now the, yes, yeah, nice. it, it is cute. Um, I, I, because we're short on time, I'm not spending a lot of time talking about the presence effect, uh, but that's, uh, you know, uh, it, it's very reminiscent of the, although this processing is monorail. So. That's a nice result. The other thing that's kind of interesting is that doing that processing improves the recognition accuracy a little bit in clean speech as well. Uh, it's not easy to see because of the you know, uh, data point overload here. Uh, but uh, that was surprising to me. Uh, it's consistent with the fact that you're kind of uh, differentiating the spectral envelope or the power envelope coming in. Uh, I don't know how well it's going to hold up in noise, though, because typically uh, differentiating things in noise is bad. Uh, so, <coughs> th this, these reverberation results were done in the absence of noise. However, when you have both noise and reverb, uh, you know, the noise will make things worse, but uh, you'll still get the same hierarchy, hi hierarchy of results. It, it, it really does help. So, there are quite a number of parameters. You're talking about uh, adaptation, right? That's, that's temporal adaptation. Uh, it, it's a form of temporal adaptation, that's right. So there are about four or five parameters, did you? Uh, I will confess, again, I don't do anything. I, I just edit the papers and try to get the students to stay on message. But uh, they do all the work. Uh, this was, uh, there, there were free parameters and, and they were, you know, what you see are the results with the best parameters. Uh, we do typically run these over many different kinds of uh, noises and, uh, you know, it, it uh, in, indeed, it is the case that some parameter <laughs> values are better for some. We, we try to find a set of parameters that looks the best for the noises that we consider. Typically, the suite of things that we, look, we tend to look at are white noise, uh, speech babble, uh, individual interfering speech, street noise, and background music, and simulated reverberation. Uh, typically, um, as, as, uh, typically, of those, the most difficult kinds of interference are the individual speaker and background music. Uh, and the, the most benign is white noise, and uh, reverb is kind of orthogonal to everything else, but also quite difficult. Okay, uh, I want to talk for a moment about an integrated front end, and I really apologize for this. Uh, you know, uh, uh, just turn your heads on your sides, if you don't mind, for a moment. I, I tried to, uh, I need to redraw this clearly, but there are too many boxes. 
Uh, what we're looking at uh, is uh, Chen Wo Kim's PNCC algorithm. This stands for Pace Normalized Capsule Coefficients. And this is a block diagram comparison of uh, MFCC processing, <coughs> PLP processing, and PNCC processing. Uh, the most important things are uh, there's a different frequency integration. That, that's uh, not a big deal. Uh, 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 PLP uses uh, their own, its own function. Uh, MFCC uses the triangular filters. Uh, there is uh, medium duration power calculation. I talked about that before. That's used for normalization. Uh, this uh, ANS stands for um, asymmetrical nonlinear um, spectral filtering, and that's the kind of uh, that's a version of the kind of onset enhancement uh, that I talked about before. Uh, there's a uh, temporal masking, uh, which actually, uh, again, gives you the on, uh, effect of the onset enhancement, uh, and uh, waiting across channels, uh, and then a certain amount of normalization. So uh, you, you get something that looks like capsule coefficients. There's code for this, by the way, available online, and uh, a paper that we're writing, and papers that have already been published that cover most of the details in, in fairly cryptical forms. I just want to talk about um, performance, uh, do a few performance calculations, and I can talk later about uh, what blocks give you what. But uh, this again is uh, MFCCs are down here, uh, and this is, by the way, Wall Street Journal 5K in white noise. Rasta PLP is a little bit better, not a lot better. Uh, this is uh, Melcaps with VTS applied, uh, you know, substantially better. And uh, PNCC, uh, uh, is, is up here. Uh, background music, uh, as, as I indicated before, the uh, magnitude of the improvement is, is less. And, and again, uh, but, but it still is, uh, this is still you know, several dB. Uh, again, um, in this case, uh, baseline is here. Uh, Rasta PLP is worse. Uh, VTS doesn't help much. We, we, we've known that since 97. The VTS isn't very effective in, in music. Uh, and we get some improvement. Although, again, it's not as much as we'd like. There are other things that we could do that, that I'm not going to show that, that show better results in, in, uh, in, in background music. So, so, so for 5K, mostly general, I think the baseline typically is about 95% accuracy. So it yeah. seems to be okay. pretty, pretty low baseline. Uh, well, in, well, the most important thing here, this, this is about 89%, 87 88%. Uh, we always detune the language models uh, because uh, th there's, uh, we do this more for resource management than for Wall Street Journal. Uh, this is one pass. Uh, we're not interested in all the things that are done to clean that up. and We're only concerned with relative uh, improvement, uh, especially with resource management. If you have any sort of uh, language model at all, things just kind of snap into position. Uh, uh, and it's uh, you know just a very bad indicator of the quality of acoustic models, uh, just because the task is so trivial. Now, Wall Street Journal, of course, is less susceptible to that. But uh, suffice it to say, uh, this is a very simple one-pass system. Uh, not at all the kind of thing you do in an evaluation, and uh, we really didn't work to optimize it at all. Uh, the last thing is uh, reverberation. Again. Uh, uh, Melcaps are here. Rasta PLP is worse. Uh, I've had, it, as I mentioned to some of you, I've had discussions with Hina Kormansky to, you know, confirm that we're not, you know, you know, abusing Rasta PLP here. This is the implementation out of the box from the Dan Ellis website, and as far as as far as he and I can tell, the numbers are legitimate. Um, again, uh, VTS does not provide any great improvement in reverberation once the reverb time exceeds the frame duration. Uh, and again, because of some of the nonlinear processing we're talking about before, there there is an improvement here. And there is no noise. Uh, in this case, um, I'd have to look. There may be 10 dB signal to noise ratio. So or, eight, the improvement in clean under clean conditions. Say it again. In the previous chart with the reverberation, it was a way higher improvement <coughs> when you do the nonlinear processing. So pretty much, but under clean, no noise conditions. That, that's right. And I'm, I'm, I would have to check to see if there's noise here or not. May, may not be. And I'm thinking that there isn't because if you look at the clean, if the zero reverb time is up about the same as it was before. Yeah. So I suspect no noise. Mm -hmm. Basically, the SSF algorithm, again, we have a bunch of things. Uh, the SSF algorithm that I showed is better in reverb than PNCC. PNCC is intended to be something that is best all around. 
uh, provides improvement in noise and reverb. They're actually, uh, in the special case of music, there's a different kind of noise compensation that gives a better result than we saw before. But the, the, the price that you pay is the performance in clean goes down. Uh, in this situation, in all of these, uh, uh, there's no, uh, PNCC is just as good as MFCCs in clean speech. And that was more important for Chanwu than it was for me, but it was there. I got to hustle. Uh, one thing, uh, we looked at computational complexity. MFCC, uh, and this is MFCC without VTS. If you add VTS, it's a lot more. VTS is relatively slow. Uh, PLP, PNCC, and truncated PNCC. Truncated PNCC is, as I described before, cutting down the frequencies and nothing else. So, so I thought for reverberation, the standard baseline is MFCC with long window and then to capture mean normalization and then using short window. Yeah, you can do that. I, we haven't found a huge benefit from that. No, uh, you know, it, it, it helps a little bit, and you need a long window. Uh, I hate to say this, but we are out of time. If anybody would like to stay, I can, but uh, I think that what I should do is skip everything in binaural hearing, uh, some of which is interesting, uh, and, and skip to the end. Uh, I will, if anybody wants to stay around, I'll, I'll flip through this very quickly, but in, in all fairness to everybody else, uh, I, let's start here. Wow. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but, but uh, a lot of them are skipped. A, a lot of them are skipped. Okay, so uh, knowledge of the auditory system can certainly improve speech recognition accuracy. Uh, some of the things we talked about include use of synchrony, although not much. Consideration of the rate intensity function helps a lot. Uh, onset enhancement helps a lot for reverb. Uh, selective reconstruction I didn't get to talk about, but is useful in, uh, again, in, in reverberant situations. Uh, I'll elaborate on that very quickly if anybody wants to stay, hang around. I'll give you the five-minute version. Correlation-based emphasis I also didn't talk about uh, is a binaural hearing-based algorithm. Uh, consideration of processes meeting, mediating scene analysis, again, uh, we didn't talk about here. We have some results based on um, uh, comparison of frequencies. And uh, the other question, of course, was do our experiences in speech recognition inform students of the auditory system? And uh, my answer for that is kind of a queasy maybe. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you the reason for that is that I had coming in, and in all my years as a hearing student, uh, assumed that uh, all of these nonlinearities and details in the auditory system were just reflections of fundamental uh, limitations of physiological tissue and were just an annoyance that we should be dispensing with and we should just model the whole thing as linear as possible because we can as engineers. And I'm, I'm certainly coming to appreciate the fact that, or appreciate the proposition that these details and these nonlinearities actually have some functional advantage for processing signals such as speech in, in difficult acoustical environments. Um, I don't feel that uh, I understand everything about them yet, uh, but uh, certainly my picture about uh, auditory processing and what it means has evolved over the years and hopefully will continue to evolve. Thank you for sharing these moments. And uh, again, uh, I'll, I'll quickly skim through some of the things we skipped over if anyone wants to see them. but I, uh, this is the formal end. Thank you. Yeah.